Pat Bertinoli, MBI Energy Services. Thank you for joining the program here today. A couple things we wanted to talk about. The Skills Initiative Program that Mr. Bertinoli is a part of, as well as his jaunt over to the east side of the state of North Dakota to go to the TEDx event in Fargo, which I'm, I'm very curious to get his uh, uh, observations on, as well as the discussion on that. Uh, but let's start off with the Skills Initiative uh, program that you have going on, or our a big push behind. So first of all, how are you doing today? And let's get into I, it. I'm uh, doing great, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be on your program, Jason. Yeah, let's talk about the Skills Initiative Program. Uh, you, this is something that you've been doing for a while and are kind of, uh, you know, Johnny Appleseed of Skills Initiative. It seems like you're planting it all over the Bakken. Well, I think uh, strategically it's, it's where we need to go, and uh, I think that North Dakota is um, – got an aggressive approach to, to getting in the game on that for sure. And when you look at the state of North Dakota, we have 30,000 jobs out there and 76% of them do not require a four-year degree. So we have to do something different to prepare our youth for uh, the jobs that are, that are right here in our own state. And when we're competing against 50 other states for labor, uh, it's important that we get this right. So um, some neat things we have going on in McKenzie County and part of a petroleum advisory group, uh, skills initiative groups. So we have all the uh, top leadership from the petroleum companies. Uh, we come together periodically uh, with the schools. You know, you're, you're looking at the uh, University of Mary, Train ND, Williston State College, and the high school. And really what we're trying to do is uh, create a pathway for these kids, knowing not, not every one of them is going to be destined to go to college. And uh, so uh, one thing that I thought was very interesting is we went in and participated with a high school on a career fair for uh, last year for they were juniors. We're going to be high school seniors this year. So a lot of us came together um, and hosted kind of a career fair just to give these kids an opportunity to come ask us questions about different careers that, uh, that we might have that they may have been of interest in. And we had literally 25 kids come talk to us um, for our MBI career fair, interested in, you know, how do I become a truck driver? How do I become a mechanic? But my biggest takeaway with these kids was I asked them all if they're having a great experience, and they all said yes. And I asked them where they were from, and they're from Texas, Montana, Michigan, Mississippi, Washington, Oregon, this the whole gamut. And I asked these kids, I said, I just want to verify you're all having a good experience here. And they said yes. And I said, when you first found out you were coming to Watford City, were you excited? And they said no. So as we've kind of worked through this program, uh, MBI has gotten into this program, what's called the Cooperative Work Experience here in Watford City. We have a, a young man working for us in our shop on the mechanic side who's originally from Wyoming, wasn't sure really what he wanted to do, but he is doing such a fantastic job for us. He'll get high school credit uh, working for us next year. And, uh, you know, we just talked to him this week, and uh, we said, is this, does this seem like a viable career for you? And he said, absolutely. He's very excited about it, but uh, we're going to use uh, this young man, and we're going to get him in front of our senior leadership in a few months just to share his experience and just – so our senior leadership can see that there's value with us getting involved at the school level to prep these kids for a career that they may not have even seen. So we're very excited about that, and uh, that's that's my take on the, the skills initiative at this juncture. And the one thing that, I, that I'm very excited about, too, is that after that experience with the career fair, I got with the school and the student council advisor, Amy Polifka, who's a, a resident of Watford City and a native. And I asked her if I could speak to her student council group. And, and literally what I asked these kids to do, and we're talking 50 kids, and uh, just knowing that they're having a good experience, I asked them if we have an out-of-state applicant who's considering moving their family to Watford City, would you be willing to talk to their high school age kids just to share your experience and your journey? And they said, we're all in. So we're going to be working with the school next year. And this is not just for MBI. This is for any company in Watford City who may have a family in transition to Watford City. We've got uh, some great kids in high school that are to willing to share their experience to, you know, help that family with their transition to Watford City. And these kids would actually have a friend when they get here. Well, I'll just plant the seed. If any of those kids would like to come on this program and share that story, we'd love to. Get, roll out the red carpet for that kind of uh, uh, voice on this platform. That's right up our alley. 
Oh, yeah, I think uh, absolutely we'll take you up on that. And, you know, the one thing, too, that we've really been working hard on just to knowing that we're competing against 50 other states for labor is that it's really important that the families have a good experience when they get here. And so from a community partnership standpoint, that's not something that we can do by ourselves. So I'll give you an example. In January, we brought in a financial planner who also is very integrated in the community and helping our spouse, our, our employee spouses integrate into mothers of preschool children. February, we brought in the uh, University of Mary. We have a, a $400 uh, scholarship program for each of our employees per semester. We had those folks come in and talk about the program. Uh, we had a realtor come in in March to talk about credit building, home purchase, and that type of stuff. So what we're trying to do is educate our workforce and provide the support that they need to have a successful integration into our community. But on that skills initiative, I appreciate the the offer to have one of these kids get on the radio because I'll certainly make that happen. But in September, we'll bring these kids in um, at a safety meeting and uh, they'll deliver to our employees that if any of them have families outside of the state and that they're looking to get into the state, that uh, these kids are in position to uh, help with that transition. Patrick Bertinoli with MBI Energy Services on the line with us here. And the Skills Initiative Program, I'm really happy to see something happening with this. This is a conversation that we actually had, boy, back in the early days of this program, back in 2012 and 13, uh, during the $100 oil, we'll just say around that period, because the one thing extremes do is it really shines a light on things that are needed and things that you can probably do without. And the one thing that came from that was the need for, um, in fact, the story we did, it was titled uh, uh, Welders, Plumbers, no, Welders, Pipe Fitters, and Electricians, the Deities and Demigods of the Bakken, because they were just in demand so much that you couldn't even go out to dinner if you were an electrician without getting a couple job offers in Williston. And that showed, it shined a light on how much these tech skills these trades were really needed in not only the Bakken, but in the region. And then I'm finding out it's in other shale plays as well. So that's the one thing I felt that came out of that. So we started the discussion of the four-year degree versus the two-year degree. And uh, Michelle Comer, who's now at the uh, Commerce Department, she was with the ed education vein of North Dakota. I forget the new titles now with um, kind of the uh, d different departments that have that have changed in the last several years, but I know you're following me here, so I'm trying to uh, uh, get with this. She's been on this program before, and we had that same discussion of the four-year degree versus the, you know, say the two-year trade degree or the one-year trade degree. Um, that's really what we're kind of talking about here, isn't it? From a five-thousand-foot view, it's like if you're a parent out there, the traditional way of ushering kids into a four-year degree. That's not the case anymore. The two-year degree or the skills, the trade type thing might be the better way, way to go. Do you, am, am, I, am I on base here? Yeah, you're absolutely, you know, and the, you know, the one thing that I wanted to, to mention too is, is that um, we kind of piloted a program here in uh, Watford in March, and it was called uh, T4, Tools, Trades, Torque, and Tech. And we just had great participation from around the state. And Kent Ellis uh, and Marilyn Kipp uh, had kind of spearheaded that program. But, you know, from MBI, we actually had a semi-truck and a trailer in the event center in Watford City. But we had vendors come from all over the state to talk about robotics. Uh, we had uh, simulated welding machines. We had all types of different things. And the targeted audience was for 6th, 7th, and 8th graders to kind of plant seeds and create some curious curiosity as far as some of the careers that are out there. But that was amazing. And, and there was 420 kids that, uh, that got that message. And I had the opportunity to be the keynote speaker at the end of that deal. And I kind of got with the kids and the teachers and I said, what message do you want me to deliver? And it was really about pick a career path and develop soft skills and how to do that. So we just had a blast with that. But the other thing that I kind of wanted to segue in with all this, you know, the, the, the programs that we have going on, uh, and I'm just going to use my last week as an example, probably one of my favorite things about my HR role here is we bring very talented people to North Dakota. They're bringing talented people with them, and that's their family members. So I can tell you just in the last week, we helped uh, one of our driver's uh, wives. Uh, she was had her uh, sights kind of set on an administrative position, but uh, she has an interview tomorrow with the high school. This uh, 
this uh, person has a degree in economic finance and she's a certified tutor. So uh, we were able to work with the school and get her in position to potentially take a substitute teaching position, which could grow into something bigger and better. And then uh, got some friends at ConocoPhillips and they've got a new employee over here whose wife was also looking and she just happens to have a degree in exercise science. So we've got her uh, working with the school too, but both these people are so elated and what's funny to me is that people come here with somewhat of a planned expectation of where they might fit in and they find out quickly that their lives can take a whole nother direction and my favorite part is when that unplanned direction and career shift involves helping others our youth so it's just uh, neat that's that's one of my favorite dynamics about how it works out here is uh um your 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 career can take a shift and, and you know what i mean tools trade Torque and tech? Tools, trades, torque, and tech. It was torque. Okay, I was writing this down because T4, tools, trade, torque, and tech. Boy, that's got... That, that's got like P.T. Barnum's traveling show all over it. Go from town to town with the T4 Tools, tor- Trade, Torque, and Tech show. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, I, and it was a pilot program, and it went uh, it went very, very well. But what was nice about how Kent and uh, Marilyn, uh, you know, you had all the, you know, you had a lot of the different uh, uh, producer companies out there, Oasis, you know, ConocoPhillips providing uh, some guidance and, and helping. So they had a lot of consultants, as it were. Um, to kind of help guide this curriculum and this program. Um, but the kids, I, I will tell you, it was kind of neat. We had a program for all these kids at the, in the auditorium afterwards, and they were screaming and yelling and hollering. Um, I think that they just had an amazing day, and, and uh, it was just really neat to watch. By the way, I totally forgot you worked – you work in the HR department, and when you when you said that, I just started chuckling because you know you're not your stereotypical human resource personality. And I wrote down the, the most active HR professional in industry today. I mean, that's that's really what you are. I mean, honestly, I've I've dealt with a lot of HR people because we do. Um, you know, we've got you know, 350,000, 400,000 social media followers. So there are some people that do like to post jobs on our network. And so I deal with some HR people and I always invite them to come on the program and talk about it. Hey, give the uh, job applicant a, a personality behind it. And, you know, if why not come on and, you know, list a couple jobs you have. Oh, boy, they shy away so fast. And here you yeah. are. You're just gregarious as can be. I don't know if that's a negative or positive word. I like that. Yeah, one, but... yeah. I won't take it as a negative. But, okay. you know, I guess, you know, my, my mission really in life is really to find a way to bring out the best in people. And, you know, I, I tell people that I'm in the fourth quarter of my career. But that whole skills initiative and this the relationship with the school has um, has been an adrenaline rush for me. And it's really inspired me and and. And really, I think part of the magic really is to help position employees. You know, I don't care if it's a truck driver or whoever, but if, if we can position them to uh, be a mentor, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you're just going to get the best out of that employee. And using this mechanic that's working for us right now, we've got 12 mechanics in Watford City that are providing guidance to this young man. And they're having a blast because they have a project. You know what I mean? And what's interesting that I didn't say is part of the strategy too but this young man plays football he's going to be a high school senior but what's neat about this for me is that when he plays football our mechanics don't have high school age kids in uh, school yet but this young mechanic is going to pull our mechanics and our employees to a football game and give us a reason to go to a game and what's interesting about that dynamic is even though that we're mentoring this young man on mechanics he's going to mentor us on integrating into the community and giving us a reason to be involved Patrick Bertinoli, the most active HR professional in industry today. He's with MBI Energy Services. We're talking about the Skills Initiative program that's going on up in the Bakken area, and I would imagine soon to be other places as well. But I did want to, and also the four-year degree versus the uh, skills and tech and trades and that sort of thing. Uh, I did want to transition a little bit over to the TEDx event that you attended in Fargo, and um, off the air, when we were prepping for this, you mentioned uh, Michelle Comer was kind of the the liaison or the invitation was put out by her. Was that is it, am, am, is my memory correct there? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I serve on uh, you know her workforce council uh, representing the West, uh, the petroleum side. And she uh, had extended a, an opportunity for those of us who had the availability to attend the TEDx Fargo in 
uh, Fargo to, um, I guess, stay ahead of the curve in terms of just the progressive thinkers that are out there. And, and it was uh, very value added. I'll say that. Well, I was really glad to hear that because, you know, one of the issues that that's been going on in states is kind of there's there's a divide happening with energy and uh, it's happening through, you know, different cities that have population, et cetera. And, you know, the one thing about North Dakota is, is that you can go like 30 miles from the eastern border, draw a straight line from Canada down to South Dakota, and that's 65 percent of the population. Now, there's a census coming out and that might change, but that's kind of the mindset where for every person that gets added to Watford City, you know, three, four, five get added to the university towns of Grand Forks and Fargo uh, to offset it. So it, I was glad to see whether it was intuitive by Michelle to ask or whether it was on purpose. Um, this is the, the the thing that we've been talking about with, with the industry leaders on this program on how there needs to be an communication and an information bridge from the east to the west because one of the things with Fargo is I think they're like five hours from the nearest rig to even understand what the culture and the community's like um do, do you know what I'm talking about without I'm not trying to get political here I'm just trying to shine a light on something that's going on yeah I think uh they've got some very uh interesting and intriguing things going on in the eastern side of the state and um, the one thing that I, I guess, value and appreciate by being able to be a member of the Workforce Council is that, you know, I, I see and I get to meet and network with these folks. And I was just uh, uh, talking to Michelle via email on Friday, thanking her for the opportunity to be able to go over to that deal. But they've got some neat things in the way of technology. We did a press release while we were over there um, about uh, um, a grant that uh, Governor Burgum signed and there's some interesting information going on, but the, the players that are, you know, starting and maybe planting some of these seeds in the eastern side of the state, I had conversations with every one of them, and I said, I need you in western North Dakota. And and I'm asking them, I said, I need to take you to Watford, you know, Kildare, Dickinson, Stanley, Tioga, and some of these other areas, Ross. And uh, so I was kind of sharing with her that I pre- appreciated that opportunity to, to kind of get in with uh, the group that's uh, – you know, progressively leading the state, but we definitely want a presence in Western North Dakota. How was the TEDx for you? It was, uh, it was amazing. You know, uh, um, this is the second year she invited us and, uh, uh, Michelle was a speaker this year and uh, did a fantastic job and and, and kind of sharing some personal stories about her career. And um, I think she's a, an, a, an amazing example to, to anybody that's uh professional, uh, male or female, but um, some of the ones that really resonated with me, um, there was a police officer from Fargo, Michael Bloom, uh, who got up there and kind of spoke. And, and again, you know, when I say my mission is to find a way to bring out the best in people, I see that with Officer Bloom over there and how he's working with these kids in detention and stuff like that. And they actually wrote a rap song. And it's, it's I, I believe it was, keep moving, keep moving, you know, and I, I just thought that was brilliant. And I thought from an officer's perspective to have uh, that much influence in someone's life was just was was neat to me. And then another one of the speakers also from Fargo, Dr. Corey Steiner, um, and talking about how that classroom setting may change. You know what I mean? He had a picture of a classroom with desks in there and he said, does that look familiar to everybody in here? And everybody, of course, said yes. And he said, it's been that way for the last 180 years. And he said he had some very good points that, you know, our education system says everybody starts here and finishes here. And that's not the way life works. And if you're a valedictorian, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the nicest car or the nicest house. And so I thought he was very progressive. And I'm very excited, you know, just with my involvement with the school to see how this education system is going to transition over time to have the best interest of every student and just knowing that every one of them is important and every one of them has value and every one of them has a purpose, whether they're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a mechanic, a welder, don't care. But I, I see some just brilliant things uh, fermenting. Um, to, and it's, it's going to be just a neat thing, but I thought he did an amazing job in his presentation. We had an electrician on yesterday talking about the – amount of work and certification and professionalism you got to go to become a master electrician and how uh he compared it 
<clears throat> right along to a doctor, lawyer, attorney, all these different professions that, that need that. And he said it's the one thing that he got from the um, latest energy push, I guess, the boom over the last decade was it shined a light on, you know, some of these, the importance of the trades. It kind of elevated the prestige a little bit. It gave, yeah. It, yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, I totally understand. And I'm just going to, you know, talk about this young mechanic that we have uh, working for us, high school senior. And I asked him if he was on the student council and he goes, well, no, I don't really fit into that group. And I said, I disagree. And so that's where I feel like I can have an influence because something I've not told a lot of people is uh, I graduated from Three Forks, Montana, and I was not necessarily voted most likely to succeed. I was number 23 out of 27. But I'll tell you what helped me throughout my career and throughout my life is I had people believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. You know what I mean? And so I'm not here because of me. I'm here because I had a support system throughout the thing that saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. And so when I use this mechanic, this young mechanic for us, I see things in him that he doesn't see in himself. And I told him, I said, I'm pushing you. And uh, we'll find a way to get him on a student council and uh, represent the mechanic portion or the, the trades. So what's next for you? We're kind of winding down a little bit here. I know you got some kind of event coming up, I'm sure, that uh, uh, is happening. Well, we got uh, a lot of stuff going on the workforce uh, council side of things. Uh, but uh, the other thing that I'm very excited about that uh, I somehow got bullied into participating in is the Census 2020 Committee. So I'm on the state uh, council for that, uh, the task force. And um, so we've got some things moving in there and really uh, trying to find avenues to educate the people in the state to make sure that we get everyone counted. So we've got subcommittees that represent business and labor, community faith-based education, uh, library, um, government, media, tribal, and commerce. So we've got a great committee and we're just working with uh, these complete count committees throughout the state and feeding them information, but it's going to be a full court press. And uh, this is very critical that we get every person counted in the state for the 2020 census. You know, I interviewed uh, Dean Bankson and Nancy Holder from NDSU. They did a population study, and I, I can't even remember if it was connected with the census or not. I know it was a study on its own where they went and tried to find every person that was, you know, sleeping on a hay, ba a hay barn and everybody who had a trailer behind, you know, this guy's property, and even if they could get the, get the people sleeping in Walmart's parking lot. Now, it, times are different now than when you know that was happening but there are still some people living in you know trailers and people's backyards and fifth wheels and etc um does the census have any way to get to those people is it is it just what we're doing here by getting the word out or uh, i think it's getting the word out and yeah. it's educating them I, I think you know i'll just give you an example you know we expect that the the children population is going to be up 22 percent we uh, project that the american indian population is uh, going to be up 25 percent but I think it's uh, just educating these folks and, you know, in the oil and gas side, you, you may have, uh, there's, there's a lot of people out here are on somewhat of a rotational schedule. They might work here two weeks and then go back to Texas or wherever for a week. But we have to educate those folks to let them know that you're here the majority of the time. You need to be counted here. And then also just creating peace of mind, you know, for these folks that this information is collected for the census only. It does not go to your landlords. It does not go to anyone else. And just creating some peace of mind that this information is confidential and used for the census. And uh, and just educating them just to know just that they have a huge impact uh, um, on bringing new business to the area. Um, you know, I was highlighting there's 50 ways that census data uh, are used, but it's for planning hospital, nursing homes, clinics, and the location of other health services, uh, forecasting future housing needs for all segments of the population, um, establishing fair market rents and enforcing fair lending practices. Um, and the big one that could potentially affect us on the west side is reapportioning seats in the House of Representatives. So this is a big deal for every person that we miss based off of 2010 census numbers, uh, we miss out on $1,910 a year in federal funding. And that's 20,000 over a 10 year period, you know, and that's using 2010 numbers. So that number is likely going to be much more significant for anyone that we miss in the 2020 census. And that's really one of the most important things here. I mean, and when I say important, I mean that you've got, you know, senators like Richard Wardner going and making sure that there's bills like the Prairie Dog Bill to ensure that the western side of the state gets money. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah. that's really what this boils down to. 
if, if we miss it by the just the small percentage we missed it in 2010, uh, the state has uh, at risk or uh, $43 million in 2020 of federal funding. Um, so this is this is a real important subject, and we got to get it right. And and so, like I say, I'm, I'm uh, elated. We kind of looked at the marketing techniques of some of the surrounding states, and I will say that uh, Governor Burgum, you know, putting this this work uh, or this task force together, uh, we got some very influential people on there, and I think that this group will make a significant difference. And I anticipate we're going to have great results in the 2020 um, census. You got a website or anything yet that people can go to? I mean, this doesn't start till next year, right? Yeah, we're kind of in the education phase right now. Yeah. Um, and But you'll start seeing at some different um, uh, venues that will have booths out there, and I would just encourage anybody that's listening, if you see that 2020 booth, uh, census booths, just go inquire and ask questions. And, you know, and if I could ask a favor of you is ask how you can help. And um, I think we just got to get the message out there. And, and there's a lot of good questions. And there are, you know, all these, uh, they call them CCCs, Complete Count Committees. Uh, Mackenzie County's got one up, and they are in the process of building a uh, website. But uh, um, we'll get some of that information out uh, in the very near future as far as how people can get access to the information that they need to help us drive uh, a positive result. All right, kind of final question here. I like to give um, people, of course, the direction to go wherever they want if they want to reiterate something or if there's something we have not talked about that needs to be talked about or if somebody has a good barbecue recipe, I'll even allow that. Whatever they want to, <laughs> whatever they want to talk about. That way it's not framed by me. So the uh, floor is yours, sir. All right. Uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, kind of just from a purpose-driven um, standpoint, I think – you know, the one thing it's kind of, it's interesting as we go through life and we, you know, our journey and the things that we learn and the people that we come across. But I would say that if I had any advice for your listeners, it would be to get more involved with the school. Um, you know, I, you know, the, the schools, they want guest speakers to come in from industry, from different businesses and stuff like that. They want these industry leaders to come in and help with mock interviews. They want, uh, you know, we, we, we can just make things more real at the school level. And, and that's really where I'm kind of focusing some of my efforts on. And, and this is going to, you know, hopefully affect retention for even our employees at MBI as our kids get into school. I have such an amazing vision for these folks and their kids and where they're going to land once they leave the high school system and uh, bouncing into a high paying job. So I would say that uh, I think there's a huge opportunity there for everyone in the working world to get involved with the school and help those folks out. Those teachers are amazing. And uh, uh, what they do is just uh, impactful on where we're going to land as a state in the future. 